all knew it, but now there's proof. There are some clear COVID-19 winners and losers. An Oxfam study shows that the world's 10 richest men have doubled their fortunes during the pandemic, while more than 160 million people are projected to have been pushed into poverty since the pandemic hit. But what if I told you that this doesn't have to be the trajectory we were going down? Let's take a look at why the world has become even more divided and dispersed in the past two years and what we can do against this rising inequality. Because there are actually lots of solutions floating around, including from the very people who have increased their wealth during the pandemic, now asking to be taxed properly for the greater good. We've really had, during the pandemic, an inequality explosion. And it's been a period that has been an unprecedented boom for billionaires. It's a question of resource distribution. There's enough resources on this planet, but the distribution doesn't work. It's no secret that the world has always been divided into the poor and rich. But while we were on a good way to close this gap, the pandemic has been a huge setback. One of the reasons is the governments across the world cut interest rates to record low levels during the pandemic, while central banks bought up government bonds and stocks in order to increase economic activity. All of that led to soaring stock markets, benefiting those who already had money and investments. It was hard not to make any money on shares and uh, speculation within the last two years because the entire market was going up. And this was because of the uh, liquidity support of all um, central banks worldwide. Meanwhile, the rest of the world, and especially those who couldn't work from home, experienced dramatic income losses during the pandemic. And it was especially those who were already poor and vulnerable who suffered the most. Urban informal sector workers have been affected more uh, than formal sector workers. Women have been affected more than men. And workers with less education have been affected much more than workers with more education. Just because of the nature of work that they're engaged in. A lot of these people are in the service sectors, which are basically you know, client-facing services, which are the first one to be affected when economies close down and mobility was restricted because of the pandemic. You know, there needs to be support for, for those groups which have suffered the most during the pandemic. And it includes you know, policies like access to finance, access to training, uh, in some cases providing support to households and so on. Data from the World Bank shows that the poorest 20% of the globe had the steepest decline in incomes. Unfortunately, they're also the ones to recover the slowest. As jobs are coming back, it's not as if that all women who have lost jobs are coming back at the same rate as male workers. The poorest 40% have not started to recover their income losses, while as the top 40% has actually recovered quite a bit of their initial income losses. So the difference in recovery essentially results in the gap between the top and the bottom widening over time. One field that is responsible for a large rise in inequality and a slower recovery over time is education. A large fraction of children in poorer families, particularly those in low-income countries, have not had access to learning during long school closures amidst the pandemic. Data by the World Bank suggests that the share of 10-year-olds who cannot read a basic text could reach 70% in low- and middle-income countries because of school closures. The implications of that for income distribution in the future, I think, are more severe than anything that happened to jobs and incomes now. One of the biggest reasons for a slow economic recovery in the Global South has been the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. While only 7% of people in low-income countries have received a vaccine dose, more than 75% have done so in high-income countries. One idea that is being discussed globally is a billionaire's income tax, or a wealth tax. The money could be used to invest in worldwide vaccine production, as well as healthcare and the fight against the pandemic and inequality. And believe it or not, some ultra-rich people themselves are all for it. Over 50 millionaires and billionaires in German-speaking countries have banded together in a group called Tax Me Now, demanding to be taxed properly for the greater good. I think it's very important that the class of millionaires and even richer people stand for tax justice. We're facing a once-in-a-century challenge right now, facing ecological disaster, the failure of democracies, uh, the rise of populism, and the large inequality crisis. And all of these challenges are linked to questions of resource allocation, 
and there is enough resources. So we as the rich people's class, we can choose if we pay our fair share or if we're um, facing things like revolution and social unrest. Tax Me Now wants the rich to be taxed more on a national level and fight against tax havens on an international level by introducing measurements and minimum taxation standards. So my average tax level is lower than the tax level of my employees. Um, yeah, that's not okay. I can um, assure you that we have a lot of privileges right now that we shouldn't have. Like we are not being taxed for heritage. We're not properly taxed for capital gains. We have a lot of loopholes and possibilities to evade tax on a legal basis. And as well, frankly speaking, it's too easy to evade um, uh, the taxation on the international basis. And these things at least shouldn't be legal. But how exactly would it work to change that on a global scale? We all know how easy it is for millionaires to maneuver their money or the headquarters of their companies to tax havens such as Switzerland, Luxembourg, the Cayman Islands, Hong Kong and Singapore. It has to be done with international cooperation. Otherwise, they will be able to just move it around, right? You know, so, so sort of establishing minima that, that, that prevent certain countries from trying to act as tax havens. And of course, the, the minimum corporate tax that's being uh, agreed at the OECD and now has to be ratified and so on is a start in that direction. Um, it shows that with political will, it can be done. What we think about is, for example, a property register. We believe 30% of all the property of the millionaire, the billionaire class is being um, hidden away in international tax havens. So long as money is, is, is liquid and it's flowing around as money, it's flowing through the banking system. The banking system has a stake in uh, the economy and it can be affected by, by the government. The government can, you know, different governments can seriously constrain what banks do. Um, they just want, they just need to want to do that. Rich people uh, are, are, are very good at lobbying and, uh, and they have a lot of backing in, 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 in government. And so greater attention paid to this by, you know, everybody else, the 99%, if you like, uh, can play a real role in changing the political game. That's, of course, easier said than done. We know from experience that coordinated global action on issues like this is often slow and patchy and doesn't happen overnight. That's why some initiatives are not directing their attention to only the rich, but also the global middle class. Many of us, especially those living in developed nations, are actually richer than we may think. And by donating just a fraction of our income, we could help end poverty and boost shared prosperity as well. We still have so much more than many people in the rest of the world uh, who don't have the same social safety net, who don't have the same um, services and baseline living standards that we have in countries uh, like Germany and like Australia. A median income in a rich country like the UK or Australia puts you comfortably within the top 5% richest people in the world. And that money can improve the life of someone in extreme poverty about a hundred times more than it can improve your own life. And it turns out the pandemic might have just been a push that people needed to snap into action. But it has been you know, quite heartening to see a lot of people who do have more throughout this pandemic and take a moment and realize that now is a really good time to be giving, especially those who have benefited from things like a stock market rally. And I've seen people really turn that into empathy, into compassion and go, yeah, if this is what it's like for me, um, when things are actually relatively good and, and the worst case isn't that bad, I couldn't imagine being in a situation where it's much worse. And I have seen that drive compassion and I really hope that is quite lasting. The pandemic is likely going to be with us for a while and its economic aftermath for an even longer time. It's a global crisis that affects all of us and hence needs a global response. That's why the experts we talked to for this report believe it's a matter of self-interest as well as a moral and humanitarian duty for the richer world to help those less fortunate. Otherwise, the pandemic will persist longer than it otherwise would. Global inequalities will grow even more, disparities will widen, and there will be global divergence. It's not just about inequality today, it's also about what the current impacts can mean for inequality and social mobility in the future.